Hello and welcome to our 60th lesson in the current micro series in lockdown three. Today is actually the 1st of April 2021 and so it actually signifies a change for those who have had to shield and they may go out of their houses now. And this is also marking the last day of our current series where we're going to be looking at the final study, number 60, in the book of 60 studies by Foyard. Today's study does have a temper mark of Lento, and as we've discovered through this journey, many of them don't have any, any indication. And the idea is always to liberate the cellist to not be compelled to speed, um, but to take their time in, in precision of technique. Um, so this Lento, um, temper mark is really an indication of being very still and steady with the left hand. The whole study is about the left hand and specifically it's described as for exceptional extensions. What do we mean? Of course the standard extension which we'll all know if you need to reach out from first position for a G sharp, you'll have learned this way back when, we do reach out but the stretch is actually between the first and second fingers. And the same when one's going backwards, say to reach for an E flat, you're stretching the first finger back. And again, the stretch is naturally located very comfortably between the first two fingers and remain uh, a nice consistent shape for the, the lower part of the hand there, supporting the little finger typically. But sometimes we have to go a little further. Now, even the stretch between the one and two, if you're looking at an octave, <laughs> which is the beginning of this study, I mean, most typically you'll still have the second finger, second, third and fourth semitones apart so that you have true intervals in the hand rather than a stretch where they're sort of sort of somewhere displaced equally in the middle, which case neither of these two notes are true, they're both flat. So that is a normal way that we might stretch out for an octave or for a fourth, where again we're keeping the stretch between one and two. However, you know, we have to explore other possibilities of stretch between less comfortable fingers, three and four, two and three, etc. And, uh, you know, that some solutions required in a piece of music means that you are best placed to do that, particularly, say, in a very fast passage across the strings, something of that order. So let's find out what they're like. Um, the key is C major, which is very common. And I mentioned about trying out different stretches. So in the second bar, we have chromatic notes. And then there's a whole tone between three and four. Now, when you are just trying out these stretches, and especially if they're on the A string, you may find it more comfortable just to bring your thumb a little further around the side of the neck so that you really are coming from above the fingers because you don't really want to cause yourself any kind of strain in the little finger. If I put my thumb back behind here, you can see that I'll be reaching up the little finger and it could be a little uncomfortable. Help it. Just raise the arm a bit so that you are actually coming from over the top of the little finger rather than straining it out by itself. So that kind of stretch happens a few times. I mean in the second bar, third bar, beg your pardon, we are actually looking at a stretch in between in the middle two there, so a bit like your Spock salute, um, getting a nice big stretch between two and three. Um, other areas. You then, funnily enough, you might have to look out for where there are ordinary stretches. Um, the fourth bar is an ordinary stretch between one and two, and same again at six, and same again bar 16, maybe one less obvious in bar seven, where we're crossing the string and it's only an ordinary stretch. And when you've done a few extraordinary ones, you may uh, get the ordinary ones misjudged. Um, other stretches that we encounter would be between two and four. That'd be sort of pentatonic kind of sound there, and that's in bar six. So the stretch is between one and two in a normal way, but also two and four in an extraordinary way or exceptional. Um, I think that's pretty much it, and it's um, there are some stretches in the lower positions. Uh, on the D string, for example, in bar 15. And there, where you have the two to four stretch, which we've just 
touched upon it on the A string, because of course the intervals are so much wider apart in these lower positions, that will feel like one step further of stretching the hand. Um, okay, so let's give it a go. And as I mentioned at the start there, keep the tempo steady so that you really are observing the hand stretch and trying to keep those fingers all down, supporting each other for the little finger. Don't try to avoid this sort of thing where you're not placing the other fingers on the string. Okay, here we go. interesting stretching and trying to keep the connectivity in the legato nature. Uh, I mean there's a lovely moment in the middle, bar 10. Uh, where we're reaching across all two octaves there um, and, and stretching and connecting the notes would be really what we're aiming at. So that's the study as it presents itself. I mean, in terms of something else you might like to explore, um, I, I have been this term actually working with my students about looking at developing this sort of stretch. Um, only really the ordinary stretch between, you know, one and four, where really we're looking at the first finger being the one to be pushed away from this group of three, which try and maintain a semitone shape. If I demonstrate this in fourth position on the D string, we would just um, gradually go back, oscillating from the C here. Stretch, bigger stretch. That's all it is. But if you actually take that back a semitone, a time, you'll gradually come to a point where you get an enormous stretch. So for example, if I'm in lower second position, so I've now got my fourth finger on an A flat or G sharp, as you like. So this final fourth, that's even further than I was demonstrating there. You know, it really is an extraordinary stretch and distance, and that's the final stretch that you might need between these fingers. You could obviously always solve this with a thumb on that other fingers to relax the little finger there. Um, and the thing to do with that very simple exercise is to port it across all strings so that you know you feel how does that stretch feel on different strings and that even here in the fourth position on the C string if you keep that elbow pulled around the shoulder of the cello you'll find you're more in line your bones are more in line with that first finger stretching back and that that feeling you could sort of take a, a portion of that feeling as you transport and rotate to the A string you know, you can't get your elbow quite so far around, but that general attitude of pushing the fo forward with the elbow would help you better with the stretch here. And two other points we might make on this. One is that by doing the enormous stretches here in, in the sort of upper, lower second position and stretching back to the half position point, um, you really understand an ex the extremities of the hand stretch and it means that when you come back to these areas, you know, doing octaves in these higher positions, will feel less of a strain. So there's a benefit to it. Um, and the second point I wanted to make about that particular study is, um, it's interesting to kind of divert your mind 
from the, the, the things you think you want to think about. So you're thinking about the left hand of a stretch and in that demonstration I was showing you the slurring in pairs. But try this. Try slurring them in threes. <laughs> stretch there. The idea about thinking of, of slowing in threes is that you're breaking up the connection between um, a pairing pattern in the left hand and doing something different with the right and that many of the concepts we have to um, uh, consider in our exploration of repertoire are where patterns don't quite match between the left hand and the right and sometimes they're imperceptible. And in that particular example, the second set is the odd one out, none of the others. I'll leave you to find out why, have a little exploration and see why that is true. And that actually concludes this particular series, but there will be more and we'll explore different ways of looking at the instrument, some of them in the context of beautiful repertoire. I look forward to seeing you again soon.